good evening and uh, welcome to Pi Data. Uh, so uh, I'm Karthik, um, and I'll be uh, giving a presentation on uh, what is scikit uh, from scikit-learn to TensorFlow estimators. Uh, so this will be purely a hands-on sort of an approach. Uh, we'll be discussing about uh, wh what is the uh, you know why are we talking about scikit-learn? Uh, what is it that TensorFlow has updated? Uh, things like what are the latest updates? What's going on? And uh, all those details about TensorFlow itself. Um, so the the main goal of this uh, talk is to um, make it very practical uh, for uh, so it's basically trying to reduce the um, you know the barriers of entry for machine learning. And uh, so the, what Scikit-Learn did uh, for machine learning, the classical techniques, uh, TensorFlow is trying to do that for deep learning. And uh, in this talk, we will try to see how uh, TensorFlow is sort of adopting uh, Scikit-Learn's methodology. Uh, when it comes to deploying and developing uh, machine learning models. Uh, so let, uh, before I begin, uh, let me say, may, you have a, uh, may your local minima be global, uh, where your variance be bounded, uh, your label, uh, you have label data plentiful, and uh, a compute massive. So uh, that's, uh, that's not my quote, so I, I'm quoting Ilya Sudskever from Twitter. So this is, uh, this is a wonderful quote. And I think this is very apt. Um, now that we are in 2018, uh, I think it's all the more important that uh, we have, uh, so now that we have massive computes, um, but uh, quite a lot of data issues and things like that, this uh, code sort of uh, um, wish uh, more so uh, actually makes it uh, all the more important for all of us uh, working on machine learning. So uh, before I begin, let me uh, give you a brief introduction to uh, who I am. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, like I introduced, I'm Karthik Muthuswamy. Uh, I work as a data science researcher at SAP. Uh, I work at the SAP Innovation Center Network uh, uh, here in Alexandra Technopark. Uh, I'm also a Google developer expert in machine learning. Uh, so there are a few in Singapore, and I was one of the uh, first few here. Uh, and uh, I'm also a proud alumnus of NTU, uh, where I did my PhD. Um, some time back. So I've been here in Singapore for quite a long time now. And uh, yeah, so this is a, a brief introduction to uh, what I do. Uh, at SAP, what we try to do is uh, we have a machine learning, uh, a complete uh, machine learning center, uh, where we try to actually see how we can leverage uh, user data for uh, getting insights. So this is um, not talking about uh, you, you know, Google, uh, you know, what like uh, you have from website data or uh, things like uh, how do you, you know, privacy. So we actually take privacy is one of the biggest topics since at SAP. Uh, we, we try to see if a customer has uh, some sort of a data residing on a database. Uh, we are trying to leverage the, the information that we have to provide insights into that sort of a data. So things like structured data, unstructured data. So structured data being, um, say, something like CSVs or databases, so things like that uh, are of interest for us. Uh, images also come into play here. Uh, so most of our, um, as you might uh, uh, have understood, most of our text, uh, so most of our data is actually uh, revolving around text, So which means that we need to see what probably a user is actually talking about or uh, what is it that actually uh, goes on in, in what the customer is actually storing. Uh, so for me personally, what I do is my day job involves around um, understanding data. Uh, coming up with uh, models, so playing around with different models. So I'm talking about machine learning models. So uh, so coming up with new insights to data, and uh, so this is fun. So more or less, um, I actually work on uh, to, from start to end. Uh, how do we understand data, and uh, how do we bring insights from the data? So and this topic is also more or less. Um, uh, set up on that side. So it's like, how do you understand data? How do you, uh, you know, make it usable? And how do you actually train a, a classifier or some sort of a machine learning model uh, that could actually solve the problem? So let me move on. Um, in this case, so the objectives, uh, like I said, are basically uh, trying to understand data, visualize features, um, and uh, more so about the TensorFlow estimators. Um, and also explore some of uh, TensorFlow estimators. So there's something called a pre-made estimator or a canned estimator. Uh, so trying to see how we can leverage that. 
Um, another thing is also uh, how do we develop our own custom estimator. So now that you say there is a canned estimator, uh, is it even, so why, does, why do I have to use a pre-made estimator? So what we will try to do is uh, we will try to use a pre-made estimator and uh, use, uh, uh, you know, try to develop our own deep neural network uh, using a, a custom estimator. So that's also one of the objectives of the session. And finally, juxtapose uh, scikit-learn and uh, TensorFlow estimators. So uh, what I will do is this is quite hands-on. So uh, I'll also share the code. All the code is already on my GitHub repository. Uh, I'll share the link for the GitHub also. Uh, the idea here is that um, uh, if you, so just to, before we start, so probably uh, I just want to know how many of you have used Python before? Okay, yeah, almost everyone, so yeah. And what about uh, scikit-learn? Okay, quite a few. Uh, how about TensorFlow? Okay, so, so it's more or less uh, half and half, I would say. Uh, so uh, did you like using TensorFlow yeah. before? So have you, so, uh, have you used, yeah, yeah. So have you used ten, uh, TensorFlow and scikit-learn? So how many of you have used TensorFlow and scikit-learn? Yeah, okay, so quite a few. So uh, it looks like, uh, so, so there are quite a few people who've used scikit-learn, who've used, so the intersection between scikit-learn and TensorFlow users uh, are this there. So, which means that, so uh, the, the point here is that, uh, so people who've uh, used scikit-learn actually find it very, very, very useful because uh, the paradigm is quite straightforward. You, you, you just take a, an, an estimator or some sort of regression problem, all you have to do is just massage the data and then use the proper classifier or regressor and then uh, call the train fit and the predict paradigm. Uh, so this is actually proven to actually give very good results so because uh, people find it very, very useful. However, uh, what TensorFlow did was it said, okay, let, let's talk about sessions. Let's talk about graphs. Uh, let's create a session and then run inside, you know, run the graph on that session and then uh, think about managing all the objectives, do all this. So what happened was the, the barrier to entry to, to actually use TensorFlow uh, became quite um, difficult. And uh, recently what uh, Google did was basically said that, okay, let's revamp this. And this is also because uh, a lot of people uh, started using, uh, started creating wrappers around TensorFlow. Uh, so if you were uh, quite early adopters of TensorFlow, you would have seen a lot more wrappers earlier like TFLearn, which is also there still. Uh, there's also, there was also something called SKFlow which is still there, but uh, TensorFlow has sort of adopted that. Uh, and uh, that's the one of the culmination of uh, that is what uh, TensorFlow estimators is. That's actually started off uh, the reason why TensorFlow estimator actually started into coming into play. Um, so what we will do is we will actually see how uh, we can actually probably, you know, have a scikit-learn model along with the TensorFlow uh, model, and then we can develop it together. So the data pipeline will be the same. But what we will try to do is basically just use the data pipeline that we used in common and then simply train a TensorFlow model as well as scikit-learn model um, and then see how easy TensorFlow has made it to actually develop one. So uh, that's one of the objectives uh, also from the session. Um, and in the end, you should be able to uh, quite easily take up TensorFlow if you are a scikit-learn uh, user and probably people who don't actually like using TensorFlow uh, should probably uh, be able to uh, you know, appreciate the fact that TensorFlow is also, uh, is also an evolving uh, software, which means that, uh, so I think there is a dev summit in March 30, uh, on March 30th this year. Uh, that could be new breaking changes and of course, uh, newer APIs, newer uh, versions, and of course there's gonna be, so one of the uh, quickest, uh, you know, adapting um, library uh, for machine learning. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, uh, there's always gonna be constant changes and without change, I think uh, there won't be much progress. So TensorFlow is actually moving towards that, so where uh, it could be uh, quite easy to actually develop and deploy the model into production. So uh, let's move on. So uh, what I will try to do is uh, probably talk about uh, what, so why are we actually talking about this? So uh, first of all, I'll introduce something called the TensorFlow input functions. Uh, what the input functions are basically, uh, it tries to allow, pass, you know, it tries to pass features. So it allows you to pass features uh, as well as the target data. So basically uh, get the train, predict, evaluate pipeline directly in. Um, it also allows to you to do feature engineering. For instance, what happens is uh, if, you have a, uh, tra if you have some data, so and you would like to have, uh, say, some pre-processing to it, so probably drop some NANs, or uh, if you would like to you know, pre-process your strings to maybe bring it down to lowercase characters, so things like that. Uh, what the input function does is it allows you to do the pre-processing inside the function. Uh, 
so this would be the way uh, in which the new uh, input functions actually work. So this is like, uh, so I'll tell you how this actually fits. So towards the end, all of this will actually fit in, and then we will actually go uh, through the entire example. Um, and uh, so this is, for example, how an input function would look like. So for example, you could write an input function. Uh, you could pre-process your data first. And then you could actually map that to a feature column, for instance. And then you could, uh, the corresponding feature data, so basically, and you will also have a tensor for the labels itself. So similar to how uh, scikit-learn did earlier, and uh, we used to write the pipelines. In this case, what happens is an input function is basically uh, a function which is actually trying to do it and wrap it around, uh, wrap all these uh, the data preprocessing pipelines around the actual data itself. So in this sense, what happens is uh, you could have multiple uh, input functions doing different things. And all you have to do is uh, it sort of uh, encapsulates it uh, quite uh, very well. So it's super efficient in that sense that you can actually keep it all modular. And uh, you don't have to actually worry about uh, how these are actually. So in, in, in some sense, it's, it's actually how, uh, how we actually develop software. Anyway. So it's like we have modules, and we actually try to integrate that. So this way, uh, the input function also behaves in a very similar fashion. And uh, you can use your input functions to actually uh, get uh, your data back. So it's like features uh, or the label. So you, you can actually have iterators or batch the data and things like that. So the input function allows you to do all these uh, generator sort of a thing, or iterators, and you can actually get batches of data and randomize the data, things like that. So all these are possible with the uh, input function sort of an approach. The second one that uh, the, uh, so this is basically the, the dictionary. Basically, the feature is basically the dictionary that contains the key value pair, uh, the mapping between the feature columns of the tensors to the actual corresponding feature data. And on the other side, you have the labels uh, which are going to be a map from the uh, labels to the actual. Uh, uh, so it's basically it's the uh, target uh, values, which is basically another tensor which is containing the labels itself. So uh, moving on to the estimators, so uh, the main topic. Uh, estimators is actually quite a high level API. So uh, like I said earlier, TensorFlow sort of has a graph a session routine. Uh, that where you have every sa uh, every graph, you need to actually build the graph, and then you need to run a graph on uh, with a session. So every uh, graph is by default or uh, actually mapped to a, uh, onto a session, and only if there's a session you can actually run a graph on it. And uh, so what happens is here it is actually quite cumbersome when you're actually starting to learn machine learning, and uh, it actually becomes too too much of a verbose code that you have to write just to try to say uh, develop a simple deep neural network or um, a simple uh, you know multi-layer perceptron sort of an approach. Uh, so what test uh, estimator does is it basically gives you a high-level API uh, that actually makes uh, machine learning program development super easy. So in this sense, what happens is uh, you actually write very similar code to actually scikit-learn. Uh, you define your data pipelines similar to what an input function is doing, and you have an estimator that is actually saying whether it's it's basically a customer estimator or it's a pre-made estimator, a canned estimator that I sort told you about. Uh, and all it has to do is you basically call a similar routine like the the train validate and the predict routine, and uh, you get through the final um, the final model. So the one of the good things with the estimator uh, that I'll also talk about is that the fact that uh, so like I said, it actually encapsulates the train, uh, evaluate, and it actually makes it, yeah, this is one of the biggest uh, reasons why uh, estimators are actually useful. Uh, in production, what happens is uh, it is very difficult for, if you've used TensorFlow before, uh, it is very difficult for you to move the TensorFlow model from TensorFlow model to a TensorFlow serving sort of a model. Uh, the routine there is actually extremely cumbersome. Uh, you need to actually understand which is the input, which is the output, what are the data types, and uh, certain things cannot be directly ported into a, a TensorFlow serving sort of a model. What TensorFlow uh, uh, estimator does is it makes this super easy. So you, if you define the input pipeline and if you define the estimator, effectively if you can actually train an estimator with the, uh, the, uh, the pipeline that you already have, uh, you can directly export that to serving. So uh, TensorFlow uh, estimators gives you a direct ex export saved model uh, that actually lets you directly port your model into uh, TensorFlow serving sort of a paradigm. So you don't have to worry about how this is done or what will happen or how the, you know, the input functions are processed or uh, what is going to happen to the output. 
uh, the, the serving itself sort of gives you that feature. So you simply can train the model and you can, so one of the other uh, good things with estimators is that uh, the, the summary writing, right? Uh, the summary writing becomes super easy. So all your losses, all your accuracies, uh, everything is actually written by default. So you don't have to worry about uh, writing all these uh, to the file system all by yourself. Uh, estimator does that by default. And you can actually, I'll show you an example where this actually goes a full cycle where you don't have to, you, you, all you do is define the pipeline and you actually uh, train the model. Uh, estimator sort of does the training and it actually logs everything neatly and then it, uh, when, you, when you're done, you can easily export the model uh, to TensorFlow serving. So you have a full paradigm where you have from the data start uh, to the pre-processing, do the, uh, the, the custom, uh, the, you uh, define your model and you train test and evaluate, and finally you can actually uh, deploy it onto a production system. So that's how uh, complete the pipeline is in this, uh, in a ten TensorFlow serving sort of a model, in an estimator sort of a model. So, uh, oops, sorry, yeah. So uh, yeah, like I said before, uh, there are pre-made estimators as well as the ability to make custom estimators. So uh, the pre-made estimators were uh, earlier called as canned estimators, where you have uh, the, the, uh, the, all the models are pre-made, pre which means that uh, someone has already uh, taken the pains to uh, ensure that the data integrity is taken care of and that the out input and output matches. And all you have to do is simply call a wrapper function and you say probably DNN classifier and you'll say the number of layers and all you have to do is just define the input and the input pipeline and call this and then say train, uh, evaluate and predict. So uh, you don't have to worry about what the model is doing behind the scenes. Uh, the, the model itself is written and taken care of by a pre, uh, someone who's already written a, the model uh, so at the back end. So you don't have to worry about how it's done or uh, what is going to happen. Uh, so these are all you have to worry about are basically the hyperparameters and how do you actually manage those hyperparameters and uh, look at the final results. And so this way, uh, this is actually sort of, again, uh, going back to scikit-learn. Uh, you can actually see that this sort of uh, very, uh, it actually simulates a very similar, uh, very similar to how scikit-learn evolved. So you don't have to worry about how, or, uh, how things are implemented behind the scenes. If you are interested, you can definitely go ahead and take a peek or even manipulate with it, play with it, and change the source code. But effectively, if you simply want to use a pre-made estimator, uh, you can effectively do that without having to actually worry about how to implement uh, something that's actually run of the mill. So I, if I have a uh, multi-layer perceptron, if I just want to uh, use a DNN classifier and simply say the number of layers and how many hidden neurons every layer is going to have. I'll show you an example of how this is actually happening. And you can actually see how this is actually uh, very, very straightforward and how you can actually, the scikit-learn version and the TensorFlow estimator version is very, very similar in that sense. Uh, so the custom estimator on the other hand, uh, in this case, this is where you want to write the model yourself. So things like, a, say, like a convolution neural network, uh, you would want to actually define the convolution neural network yourself. Uh, and in this case, uh, the custom uh, estimator sort of gives you the wrapper again. All you have to do is similar to how I showed you earlier, you have to just write the model and you have to define the TF. So they use like TF layers or TF dense or TF, you uh, use a TF convolution. So the, all these uh, layers, they've actually brought forward. So uh, similar, very similar to how Keras worked before, uh, TensorFlow uh, works very, very similar to that. And uh, on that uh, note, actually Keras also graduated into the TF.Keras sort of a paradigm here. So now, uh, if you actually have a TF Keras uh, uh, code, you can actually use that in TensorFlow. So effectively, all you need to do is first import all the uh, Keras models in TensorFlow, and you don't have to worry about uh, what is actually, you, you know, if, you're, if your entire code base is written in Keras, and you, if, you, if you want to move it to TensorFlow, all you now need to do is just upgrade to 1.4 or above, and you can simply change your headers, which is basically import functions, uh, and you can change it to import tf.keras. I have uh, another notebook and uh, a blog on this about how do we actually move from uh, tf.keras sort of a thing to uh, use TF, uh, the keras model itself uh, and uh, leverage the keras model using TensorFlow. So earlier on, uh, you need to install Keras separately, TensorFlow separately, and if you install Keras, then Keras would actually install Tiano also. And this was a problem, especially in production, uh, where you have uh, you don't want uh, unnecessary software being downloaded and installed. 
uh, with the TensorFlow 1.4 update, uh, what happens is uh, TF Keras comes directly into TensorFlow. It was inside the contrib model, uh, contrib module earlier. Uh, now it comes directly into TF.Keras, which means that you can effectively do uh, import TF.Keras, and you can have effectively all the backend, all the uh, the distributed, uh, all time distributed uh, LSTNs, RNNs that you wrote in Keras uh, directly running on TensorFlow. And uh, the the good thing with uh, that is that you don't have to worry about uh, how the model scales on distributed systems. Uh, so because you're running a TensorFlow behind, uh, you don't have to actually, so effectively you don't change your code base, you just need to change your import level uh, you know, models and you, the code itself. And effectively you will be able to get all the, uh, the goodness of Keras. Uh, and the, 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 you know, the plus, the advantages of uh, TensorFlow running on distributed servers and giving you all the logs and TensorBoard and all that. So the, the plus, the, the advantages of both sides live here uh, with you, have you doing minimal effort in this case. So uh, let's move on. Um, in this case, so then uh, we'll talk about uh, the pre-made estimators. Uh, what pre-made estimators uh, allows you to do is it uh, sort of encapsulates the best practices, like I said earlier, uh, it, in probably in de determining where uh, different parts of the computation graphs should run. So uh, first of all, to TensorFlow, uh, just like how we spoke about earlier, uh, it actually figures out the computation graph and how it should run behind all by itself. And uh, this is actually written by someone else, so you don't have to worry about how it's doing it. And uh, the strategies about how it's uh, run on a single machine or how it's actually going to be distributed on a cluster, all of this is being taken care of behind the scenes. So which means that if you're running actually uh, distributed uh, systems on uh, your, uh, say, on your network, effectively what will happen is you need to show all these, uh, you know, you just need to show uh, the estimator where these system, the machines are running and it will uh, scale up and simply train and then it will come back with all the results. Uh, so in the back, it actually does that all by itself and you don't have to worry about how it's actually doing this for you. And the, again, the last part is about the summary. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, uh, the estimators itself is going to write all the logs and the summary for your training. Uh, which means that you don't have to go through and rewrite all the summary. You don't have to, you know, go through the logs to actually create a graph and all the results, and you don't have to plot it and then see what are the final results. So that way, it's actually uh, extremely useful, and uh, I would say it actually saves quite a lot of time because in the end, you don't have to rewrite all the code. Uh, all you have to do is, if you want to change the model, just change the input function and change the. Uh, probably, if you want, change the custom estimator. Uh, and that's all you have to do because effectively your pipeline remains intact and uh, your results are going to just reflect uh, directly on the, on the file system. Um, so a typical workflow or probably the best, the recommended workflow for using a pre-made estimator, so this is probably like a best, uh, a best practices sort of an approach here, is that you basically write your uh, data set import functions. Uh, and you define your feature columns. Feature columns are something very similar to uh, how you define, probably in this case, uh, you have population, which is basically a numeric column, uh, crime rate, which is again a numeric column, median uh, education here, which is again a numeric column, but what will happen is in this, uh, some of the cases, it could also be, uh, so uh, it will take care of uh, how these features are actually uh, being mapped in the end uh, behind the scenes. So you can actually figure out uh, how your data is going to be in this case, uh, and the me median education is also going to have a, a lambda function, which is going to actually run, uh, the, you know, it's actually going to find the mean, and it's also going to compute it, and then it's going to store it as a feature. So effectively, uh, your median is, so uh, you're effectively finding out the feature columns, defining it beforehand. So it's how in C++ we actually say you have integer, you have floats, and you're trying to tell the compiler that you have uh, some arrays which are of particular data types. Uh, the feature column is basically trying to do more or less the same idea. It's trying to allocate the data before even it actually looks at it or it looks at the original data, the data itself behind the scenes. Um, once you do that, you actually instantiate the pre-made estimator. So in this case, we're talking about the pre-made estimator, so it could potentially be a DNN classifier or a DNN regressor. Uh, so it could be any of the, uh, any of the pre-made uh, uh, estimator. And, uh, and finally, just call the train evaluate and the, uh, the and or the inference method. So you don't have to worry about 
so most of the other things like uh, this actually makes sure that your uh, code base also remains small. And it also, like I said earlier, it actually makes sure that uh, all your, uh, you have to do when you actually change the model is uh, change just the, the estimated part of it or rewrite the, the custom estimator here if you are planning to say change the estimator. Again, so I'll talk about some of the other best practices also uh, when talking about the custom estimator. Uh, the custom estimator actually provides the capability to implement your own model function, like I said earlier. Uh, but in this case, uh, I'll talk more detail about uh, what's actually happening or the best practices uh, to do with the TensorFlow estimator, uh, a custom estimator framework. Uh, what will happen here is that typically uh, one of the good things that you can do is, uh, because you have pre-made estimators, uh, don't worry about write, writing a custom estimator straight off the bat. Uh, instead, what you can do is you uh, evaluate a, a pre-made estimator if possible. So stick to a pre-made estimator whenever possible. Uh, try to uh, evaluate a pre-made estimator and see if it actually makes sense. If your data pipeline uh, and all the other, uh, you know, your integrity of the data, everything actually uh, goes well, uh, then what you can do is you can um, evaluate, uh, uh, you can go through the same idea, you can actually go through and evaluate other pre-made estimators. So the idea here is that you don't actually go for a custom estimator until you, uh, until and unless you're actually, uh, you know, uh, quite sure that your, uh, your estimator is working, your data pipeline is working, uh, your pre-made estimator actually uh, probably gives you a baseline evaluation. So this is what a typical uh, a machine learning sort of a, a data scientist would probably do is basically first start a baseline estimator. Uh, and this is what uh, is the best practice also. So you, you basically start with a pre-made estimator, try to use a pre-made estimator, and then uh, see if the pre-made estimator is still not good enough. And that is, the, uh, that is when you will actually uh, try to go for writing your own custom estimator. And in the final, uh, the final step, you would probably write and compare uh, the estimator that you actually wrote. And uh, you will actually, again, uh, one of the good things that, uh, so if you took the deep learning AI, the course by Andrew Ng, uh, he, one of the things that he keeps saying is that uh, you need to have a constant, a single measure. So uh, if you're going to evaluate a model, uh, one thing that you have to do is keep a single measure to actually evaluate, uh, say probably even 20 models or 25 models, because what will happen is in the end of the day, uh, you will have a lot of experiments and a lot of different scores. You will never know which one to compare and why it actually works well, or in the end you, will ha you are in a dilemma as to choose a particular model. So uh, always stick to a single performance measure. Uh, this actually works very well. Uh, even if you're trying to automate, say, something like a grid search, uh, then what will happen is you will, uh, using a single performance estimator, say like F1 score, could actually use, uh, could be very, very uh, helpful to you because what will happen is in the end, you need to actually say or convince your boss about, say, getting a, a larger GPU or training a deeper model. Uh, so this could be a way. Uh, you could also say, uh, you, first of all, convince yourself that probably uh, the baseline is not working or that you need to actually develop your own custom estimator. Uh, it's also to show that you need more compute or you need to actually see, uh, you know, if your data is actually, if your model is overfitting or if your data is not sufficient. All these can be done if you have a single performance measure. So I think uh, this is one of the important points. And uh, as uh, the, 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 you know, the best practice would be to actually still uh, try to stick to a pre-made pre estimator because uh, it actually has all the goodness that uh, TensorFlow actually can do all by itself. So otherwise, of course, you can always rewrite the, the custom estimator and you can implement the model. So uh, let's keep moving on here. Um, so then I'll actually switch to the demo here. So uh, what I will do is uh, I've actually shared the code. So uh, all the code is actually available on this bit.ly link. So if you're interested, you could actually download the code and run the code all by yourself. Uh, so just to keep, uh, uh, keep tab that uh, all of this is running on TensorFlow uh, 1.4, scikit 0.19. Uh, so you will have to uh, do a check on your machine and run all this code by yourself when you're testing it out. So let me know <laughs> if I can actually switch to. All right. So uh, the, for the quick test, so uh, what I will do is first I will uh, go through the first uh, uh, the example here, uh, which is comparing scikit-learn with a pre-made estimator, which is the DNN classifier. Uh, for this data set, what we will go through is basically the uh, one of the commonly used uh, data sets, which is the breast cancer data set here. Uh, the task here is to uh, uh, evaluate and actually classify uh, if it is malignant or benign. Uh, 
uh, and uh, the, 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 the data set is also available on scikit-learn here. And uh, what we will try to do is we will uh, compare. So in this case, I've uh, used a, an earlier version of TensorFlow, uh, but you can, of course, uh, you, you just need to change uh, some of the, the, the import statements to actually run this with a, a newer version. Uh, so what we do is first to load the, uh, the breast cancer data set. Uh, the, the first point is all about just about loading and uh, evaluating. So the first few lines, the first few cells, so uh, are about the train test split and uh, just making the, sure that the data is actually scaled. Uh, so this is purely feature pre-processing. Uh, you get everything uh, set before you actually think about the actual classifier. Um, so in this case, uh, the, uh, the implementation is basically a very simple uh, deep neural network uh, classifier. So uh, this is an example back in 1.2.1 uh, uh, where you use tf.contrib.learn. So this is the tf.learn uh, sort of uh, an approach that was used before. I will show you another example uh, how it looks currently. Uh, so this is to juxtapose uh, scikit learn uh, with TensorFlow estimators. This is a pre-made pre or a canned estimator. And uh, if you see, what happens is uh, you can simply use a feature uh, column. In this case, uh, I say that the, uh, the data is basically real valued columns from the input, and the input is basically from the scikit-learns uh, in train. Uh, and uh, uh, here all I do is define a deep, deep neural, uh, as a DNN classifier. Uh, this is an example of what I was talking about uh, in terms of uh, not writing your own custom classifier. Uh, all I do is basically say the input, which is basically the feature columns. And I say that uh, because the deep, deep, uh, it's a, a multi-layer perceptron, I simply say that there are hidden units, and I just give it the hidden number of units, uh, which is basically a list of the number of units. Uh, I've defined units to be 10 here, and the number of classes is 2, because I, all I'm trying to do is see if it is malignant or benign. Um, and if you see, it can actually uh, straightforward, it can uh, train uh, quite straightforward, and uh, the final results uh, are about 96.5%. Um, and if you do the same thing, so we can use, so this, if you see this, what happens is you're actually into, uh, moving from scikit-learn to TensorFlow to scikit-learn to TensorFlow. So this sort of, uh, this pipeline sort of interweaves and it actually becomes quite easy for you to actually go in and get out of, uh, uh, through any of these APIs without any issues. So all you have to do is in this case, simply define uh, the, uh, the, the, the canned estimator, and you can actually effectively get the final results just like how you would do in scikit-learn. And uh, just to, for, uh, for actually understanding if the results are good, uh, we actually plot the confusion matrix as well. Uh, but this is not sufficient, so uh, what we are trying to do is simply just train a scikit-learn sort of a model. So what is the great big deal about just training this model and then showing this? So what we will do is we'll also talk about uh, the structured data. So uh, before we talk about structured data, we will, talk, we will say, what, first of all, what is the structured data? In this case, like I told you earlier, uh, we'll have uh, data which is actually in fixed fields, uh, say CSV or TSV files, for instance, so Excel sheets or Google sh spreadsheets, for instance, uh, where the fields are all fixed. You have probably 10 columns uh, with probably each of these columns having a string or a category or something where everything is sort of fixed. So of course, every column could be a text and the length could also be long. So that's not our question here. Uh, we have uh, things that are actually, so here uh, the data is actually structured. You know uh, when you actually get in and you see the, um, the data structure, you know that uh, you can actually get and uh, retrieve proper fields from it. And one of the objectives of this notebook is also to visualize the data that we have. Uh, in this case, we'll be visualizing the UCI uh, census data. So UCI actually published the census data for US in 1990, so from 1990. Uh, so this basically says uh, the, the sum of the age and income of different people uh, in US, uh, I think in different countries also. Uh, and what we will try to do is we'll actually see uh, how we can train and evaluate and also explore the data to actually get more insights into the data even before we talk about uh, classifying the data and getting some results out of it. So uh, if, you, if you check the GitHub code, there is also a notebook called um, Facets. So what Facets does is it basically is, uh, is an open source uh, machine learning uh, exploratory tool. Uh, that actually lets you uh, understand data and visualize uh, structured data for it. So uh, what you can do is you can actually uh, download the data. It's an open source uh, uh, project. So you can actually clone the data and uh, look at it. 
Uh, in this case, what I did was simply download the data from uh, the archives of UCI, and uh, I'm just trying to see how uh, the data is actually looking. So let me simply run this code. And uh, so, uh, so typical to what we would do earlier, uh, basically see a head, uh, the pandas head from the CSV file. Uh, if you see that you have uh, different uh, columns here, basically the age, the work class, uh, there is some a number here which we don't have to worry about. Uh, it's defined in the in the names file anyway. Uh, there is an education which is telling how different people the the highest qualification of everyone. Uh, the education number, the marital status, occupation, relationship, uh, race, and the sex, and the capital gain, and the capital loss, and hours of week. So if you see that uh, we have different data, different data types, but everything is in a structured format. Uh, in the end, the target is basically saying whether it's less than or equal to 50k or not. So the question is this uh, task or the idea is that the data itself is just giving us some information about uh, people uh, in this setting and uh, the income that they actually have. So, all, so this is basically the target income. So we are trying to see uh, what the target is uh, given, this, um, so given this data that we have. Uh, so what we will do is we will basically go through uh, this data and then uh, we will see, we would like to actually get some insights from this data. So let us run through this. So what facets does is it basically uh, gives you a very neat uh, sort of a, a, a feature uh, engineering or, or not a feature engineering here, it's basically a feature visualization tool. Uh, what is great about this, it's, not, it's, it's interactive. So what, it, uh, what I can do is I can actually see uh, each of these columns and I can actually see what is the percentage missing. So if you see uh, the number of zeros here are 91.67% because uh, it looks like uh, some of these are non-zeros. And um, uh, here also, so things that actually pop up. Uh, and you can also see that, that you can actually change the, you know, the way in which the data visualization actually goes through. Uh, you can uh, change it to have a log and you can actually see that, uh, so if you see, go through the age, the distribution of the age is actually quite, um, quite skewed over here. If you see uh, people more than 60 is actually quite low. And if you see people uh, are invariably less than or equal to 40 or probably uh, very high. So number of people uh, in the age group of 20 to 45 probably are quite high. So all this sort of an analysis gives you, you can actually do some sort of, uh, even before you think about the data, you can actually see uh, what sort of uh, 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 the distribution the data is actually having. And uh, you can also see that the blue is in train and the test, uh, the, uh, the orange or the brown is actually the test data. Uh, this also shows uh, how your test and train distribution is. Uh, and hopefully you should have this, a very similar distribution, hopefully. And this is one thing that will give you that insight, uh, which means that if you have uh, an imbalance uh, in the train and imbalance in the test, hopefully the imbalance is very similar in the train and the test so that you can do a sampling that actually hopefully, you know, you can actually uh, have a very similar distribution and your training data does not actually uh, have a very high skew towards say a few classes. So all this can be actually seen here. Uh, so there are also other uh, features, the things that you can actually do to see uh, the percentage and you can also see other categorical features. So in the categorical features, you can actually see uh, how many data is missing. So this is one more thing that's actually very important. Uh, when you're actually training the data, you actually need to know if there are, there are any data missing over here. And if you see in the work class, apparently 5.64% of the data is actually missing. So these things actually um, show up just right even before you think about uh, training the data or actually looking at uh, what the data is. So these are all insights that are actually very useful for you uh, even before you actually uh, know the, so this is the distribution of the data itself. So I could actually go and see how many of these, uh, you, I can separate this by male or female. I can actually see the distribution of, if you see this itself, uh, the proportion is actually uh, quite different in this case. So let me uh, expand this here. And see, so uh, this sort of, uh, uh, you know, it actually gives you very nice visualizations about different categories and uh, how the, yeah, so the skew in the data itself. Uh, for instance, here, most of the data is about, uh, from male and uh, uh, only probably less than half of the data is from females. So this is again going to show about how we have some sort of a, a bias, the male dominance here, 
uh, in the data in our society itself. So this could also, so the exploration of the data itself is going to go and show us how we are actually evolving as a race and as a human, you know. So it's actually going to show the actual underlying problems from the data that you have. It's going to show, say, semantics. So if you're going to explore words, it's going to show how words are interrelated, for instance. So uh, these are all things that was actually a very interesting work done by uh, one of the universities in seeing bias in word embeddings, which means that uh, uh, how words are actually occurring together. So they actually did an analysis for the past 30 years, and they actually see uh, how words have evolved and how the context of the words itself have changed, and hopefully for the better. And they actually see that uh, we are actually moving towards hopefully a progressive society. So this is actually uh, this is the reason why data analysis is very very important. Sorry. Uh, even before you start training your data. So without exploring the data, without doing any data massaging, it makes no sense to start training a classifier and blame the classifier in the end and say that you, your data is not good or your classifier is not good without understanding the data. And before, uh, you, you probably you have to think about what happens if uh, I'm giving probably more data. So if the test data is purely about females and only from females, for instance, then what is going to happen to a classifier that is trained with such data? So these are implications. Uh, are very, very clear when you do a data exploration and a visualization. Uh, when you have a visualization, it's very easy to understand the, the data itself rather than just uh, look at numbers. And uh, in this case, uh, Facets does a very good job in this case. And uh, one of the nice things also is that if you go to the Facets website, uh, they give you a deep dive, which is basically, uh, it takes the entire uh, data set and actually looks at each and every single data point. So if you're going to have, a, uh, like a, say, a million data points, uh, you can actually still do a visualization. It's going to take some time, though, but uh, it'll actually give you a wonderful visualization, and it is going to actually show you some very, very interesting insights into data even before you look at or start to think about uh, training some data, some um, classifier on it. So I would highly recommend uh, looking at facets. Uh, go through these, uh, the, the examples that, the, that were provided on the website. Uh, see some examples. So uh, if, you're, uh, if you're skeptical about installing things on your laptop, or if you, if you think it's going to break you something, then try. They have some examples on their website. You can upload a CSV file, probably something uh, that's out in the open, and see and explore and play uh, with the model yourself, play with the, the data, the software. And uh, see and uh, uh, you know appreciate the effort that actually has gone through in uh, making the software possible uh, to be open source. So uh, with that being said, what we will do is we will actually uh, go to talk about uh, the structured uh, data classification. Uh, in this, uh, so having seen the data and about how the data is actually distributed, we actually see that some of the data is actually missing. Uh, say, for instance, we actually saw that the work class or one of the, the terms, one of the uh, features actually has uh, null uh, data points. So if, when you actually go through this notebook, you'll actually see some pointers and uh, uh, comments in the notebook itself telling you uh, why different functions have been used and uh, uh, what to do for uh, training this, uh, uh, using this entire notebook. So let's simply go through this and run this notebook uh, before, and while I talk about this. So, um, this requires, of course, 1.3 and above, so we are going to use 1.4. Uh, when you actually download the UCI data, it's not going to have any headers, so we define the headers, and just like how we would actually do a pandas, we actually do the same pandas uh, head here and a tail here if you want. And we actually split the data set uh, into, uh, um, so we actually pop the data, so we actually get an x and a y so that we have a target value. And we apply this lambda function so that we can actually get uh, true or false values so that we can see if a person actually has greater than 50k or less than 50k. So that's the only thing that you're trying to see. The target is basically to predict or to estimate, uh, given the input data, if a person actually gets more than 50k or not. So just from the features that we have as inputs. Um, so just again for sanity check, we will do the uh, test data train check, so it's it's reasonable. Uh, so like I said before, uh, you have in uh, data files, uh, you have the input uh, function that is a, a pipeline. Uh, you use the estimators, and in this case, it could be a pre-trained or a custom estimator, what, whatever it could be. Uh, this entire notebook has uh, uh, dis descriptions about what the input function is, how you can actually use the input function. Uh, what I will basically do is have two functions. Basically, one for train data and one for test data. Why do we have two? Uh, 
well, that's because for this case, I want uh, I want to use all the data here, and I want to batch the data here. And uh, I would like to uh, run this forever. So effectively, I would like to, the classifier to keep training uh, till the end, or when I have a, a break function, sort of a, a trigger, which is going to say enough, I, I train for enough. Or when the training data, when the training loss, maybe the validation loss starts to go up, probably. So these are things that you can actually do with, a, with having different input pipelines. Uh, you have a, so in this case, uh, the estimator, if you see directly, I can input uh, pandas input functions. There are different ways you can give the same input function, and I'm just using the pandas input function here directly, so that uh, TensorFlow estimator knows that the, the input is basically coming in from a pandas frame, data frame. And uh, in, uh, in the first case, also, I have the ability to shuffle the data, uh, which means that although I would be um, having an input pipeline that's for training, uh, in the test, I don't need to shuffle, so I don't need to waste compute. And effectively, that's, what, uh, that's the reason why we have uh, different input uh, functions here. And moving on, so we'll basically do some feature engineering, which means that we will basically convert the data into numeric values, uh, bucketized values. So bucketized values means that you're going to have split the data if you're going to have a continuous sort of a age sort of a range, right? Uh, what you will try to do is you put it into bins or buckets. Uh, so that's the idea of behind bucketization. And uh, uh, for a numeric column, you will simply use it as a numeric column as it is, uh, and you will try to uh, predict the data. You try to use the data here. And uh, let's go through here. Uh, we'll use the age as a numeric column, and we will simply get the data. And uh, like I said, so we're going to have uh, buckets. And in this case, you see the buckets from uh, in this. This is the uh, the um, the facets deep dive. So if you actually run the UCI data behind facets deep dive, what you can actually do is you can see uh, the distribution of the data across uh, ages. So you can actually see that there are actually 17 to 31. So you have buckets, basically, 32 to 46, 47 to 60, uh, the age buckets, uh, which you can actually see. And you can actually uh, split it. And then you can see the distribution of the data here. Uh, so if you see the blue is basically the target values. Uh, so there is a high imbalance in the data here. Uh, most of the people have less than 50K. And uh, probably just one tower, I would say, 10% of the data has uh, a greater than 50K. So this itself shows that. Uh, in, in this bucket, you have quite a lot of bias. And this is the reason why you need to actually do the, again, data visualization. So if you're actually going to predict, say, uh, from a bucket, and if you're going to say, most of the time, I don't get the data right, or the results right, that's, that could be because of the high bias in the data here, and because most of the target values are actually less than 50K, and you're actually trying to predict something that was at nev the classifier never saw for that particular feature. So if you put this into a particular bucket of the 17 to 31, you need to understand uh, what are the implications of not doing a proper sampling here. So that's what we will do. We will basically do the exploration also allows us to choose the buckets properly. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we will choose the buckets based on uh, the, what facets is going to give us and how we are going to use it. So uh, I'll quickly run through this. Uh, also, I'll also run the education of feature column. So basically, I'll use only the education uh, where uh, you have a set of numbers. So the, there are quite a lot more things that are there on the UCI data set, but we'll effectively ignore those or just simply uh, just truncate it. So we don't uh, worry about more than this. This covers more than 95% of the data. So effectively, we can still continue uh, with this data. Uh, the next thing is, again, uh, we'll go with the categorical information. We'll, again, uh, uh, use that data. And this is the hash bucket. So the hash bucket is where is very interesting. Uh, the hash bucket tries to, if you have categorical information, and uh, you actually try to use the categorical information to, say, uh, as, as a category, right? So uh, what you're trying to do is you're going to allocate a lot more memory for every category. And if you have, say, 25,000 categories, uh, what will happen is you're going to allocate uh, more than 25,000 values here. Uh, instead, what the hash does is it basically comes in, it creates a hash. Uh, so of course, there are, there's going to be collisions if you're talking about a hash, of course. Uh, but what will happen is uh, those are negligible. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, t the estimator sort of has a very interesting way of handling uh, collisions also. So nothing to worry over there. And of course, the collision rate is going to be very, very low. So we don't have to worry about that at this moment. Uh, but the hash basically tries to reduce the memory usage by actually getting a hash for the category. Instead of uh, allocating an entire memory space for every category that we have on the data, we can actually have a, a hash function, which is going to get a very interesting hash for that particular category value. 
and uh, finally we train the canned estimate the canned uh, uh, estimator here which is basically a linear estimator uh, j like i said like we used earlier we'll basically use the train and the test input function and uh, all we'll do is just say uh, let me just use a tf linear tf estimator uh, uh, the linear classifier and in this case i will give the input as the feature columns and uh, here if you see one more thing is the graph uh, that actually I'm telling the I'm telling estimators to save the model directory uh, in a particular place and uh, train it as a linear classifier and uh, I, I tell them how many uh, I tell the uh, I tell uh, tensorflow estimator how many classes are there for it to actually train in the end so uh, give a prediction or so uh, I'm just training it for thousand steps uh, just to do it quickly and if you see the final result uh, we should probably get about 75 percent I think so again, we will use the test, the test input function. Um, if you see, this, all this follows the scikit-learn. So all these are uh, basically uh, inspired by scikit-learn. So again, the input function is the one thing that you actually change here. Uh, all you need to do is just give the estimator.evaluate, estimator.train, estimator.fit. So sort of a paradigm here. And you would simply just do that, and then you see that it's about 76% accurate. So uh, this is the reason why, I say, like I said before, uh, we first evaluate a pre-canned uh, estimator, which is a pre-made estimator, and see how much of a, uh, a performance that we can actually extract from this data. So the next thing that we will do is basically uh, see if we can actually train. And uh, OK, so in this case, we just want to see some results, which is, yeah, some debug. Uh, just to see everything, as to probably see what is an example, uh, just to get some results. So uh, if you want to get better results, then you need to do better feature engineering. You need to understand some data. You need to actually uh, properly uh, ensure that all the, the, the points are sampled properly. Uh, you actually get the right features in. And that's also the next thing that we will do. Uh, we, what we will do here is basically uh, use uh, TensorFlow uh, with the numeric features, with the embedding. Uh, basically, with the embedding column, uh, just like uh, you would do on a word embedding, you can also do that over here. What TensorFlow does is it sort of uh, gets you a, a categorical column with a, as an embedding column. So you can actually bring the occupation into a 100-dimensional vector. Uh, similar to how you would actually represent a word in probably in like a word to vec uh, Here you can do that with the TensorFlow uh, embedding column. And uh, that is also possible here. So we will basically, again, uh, in this case, we will use another approach, which is basically the DNN classifier. Earlier on, we used the linear classifier. So now what we will do is we will uh, train a, uh, the DNN classifier, the deep neural network. Uh, in this case, we will use three, um, three layers. And we see that we have a very, uh, just like how uh, we will start with 256, and we will actually go down to 128 and 64. Uh, so if you see that you, if you are trying to uh, grasp, say, TensorFlow, or if you are trying to evaluate how good it is, uh, this is a very neat sort of an approach. All you need to do is understand the data, and you just call a simple estimator.dnn classifier. Uh, what it will do behind is basically implement the neural network for you, and then it will take care of batching it and things like that. You don't have to worry about how to save it, how to see the results, and things like that. So it's basically finished training already. Or is it, has it, no, it's only initialized the training. Uh, and uh, yeah, so let's go and then train it and then see. So in this case, now we will train for 2,000 steps uh, because we have a much deeper neural network. And you see that it actually is giving uh, very, uh, it's actually giving some more information about what the, uh, losses and the number of steps per second that it's actually processing. Uh, these are all very useful information. Uh, say, suppose you have a very deep network and you would like you probably training it for a long, long time. Uh, the the steps per second will tell you how much time uh, the model is going to take to actually finish the entire process. So in this case, uh, you will actually get a much uh, better information uh, when you actually are training for deeper networks. So this is, of course, very small. Uh, and you see that with just a deep neural network, we are already imp improving the performance to 83%. So we were just at 76%, and uh, we, were, uh, we have now been able to improve this to 83 just by changing it from, uh, say, a D uh, from a linear classifier to a DNN classifier. So uh, without doing anything to the input pipelines and without doing anything to the train functions, test functions, uh, not changing anything from the model perspective, uh, all we can do is we can actually train and then test it also. So again, like I said, one of the other things that we can actually do is um, because we have trained it using uh, TensorFlow. Uh, let me show you the TensorFlow logs. Um, so if you see this here, uh, there is a graphs. 
which it created with DNN and linear. So these are all the checkpoints that it's actually producing every single time it actually looks at the data and it's actually training. Uh, so there are different, uh, because they trained for 2000 steps, you have a checkpoint data, which is the index and the meta. If you trained a TensorFlow model before, you would see this very similar here. And you can see that there's also a folder called eval. Uh, the eval is also going to have some more data over here, which is going to have some of the events that are pertaining to the uh, evaluation of this, uh, the model that we just trained. So uh, just to ensure or just to see how this data, the training looked. So what we will do is we'll do another interesting thing. So just because we want to see, <coughs> oops. <coughs> ah, where am I? Oh, I'm already in crafts. Okay, so I can just say dot. So uh, what we will do now is basically go to TensorBoard. So what TensorBoard is going to do is uh, give us some neat uh, results. So if you see this here, uh, we are going to have a lot of uh, a lot of data here, which is not. Uh, so let's first look at the linear classifier. So if you see on the left hand side, so if you've used TensorBoard before, uh, it's actually quite good. So it's actually quite interesting to see you have different tabs talking about embeddings, you're talking about histograms. Uh, talking about the scalars, if you are actually training a CNN, you can actually look at the images that it's actually uh, trying to classify even before it is actually finished uh, training. So all these are actually possible uh, with TensorBoard. So when you're training a model, the, ac the actual model can actually go through and then uh, you can actually keep looking at the logs while the model is actually training. So uh, let me just show you the, so these are all different things that's gonna happen. So things like global step, so if you see, it started off with say close to zero and then it's increasing and then it's about 340 steps per second on average. So this is saying how quickly or uh, how, you, how fast your input pipeline is, which means that if you're say, uh, say pumping in images or if you're say pumping in uh, text from say probably uh, uh, say from another data source and that, so you need to see if that is a throttle if that is actually taking much time and because you could you cannot keep blaming your uh, you know your cnn or your your neural network for all your time lag you need to understand how quickly the the input pipeline is also so you can actually see all these uh, other global steps that is actually processing things like label here uh, the uh, the nq input so all this is actually going to show the results so the loss here will also show how good the loss was so basically it started off with close to 25 and it's sort of doing some sort of, I think if we train longer, uh, we'll be able to get the loss much, much lower. But uh, you can see that you can actually do it without writing um, much here. You actually basically we wrote barely four or five lines of code and uh, we are able to already do, say we are able to save it as a tensor board logs. We are able to save, uh, we are already able to see the accuracy. We are already able to see an improvement. We are already able to check you know, change most of the things even without having uh, to actually write much of, a, uh, you know, too, too much of a changes in, in terms of uh, uh, what we are actually doing at back end. So if you see what uh, TensorFlow is actually giving you, it's actually allowing you to uh, look at most of the, uh, the details even without, you know, uh, uh, abstract most of the details even without having to worry about how it's actually done. So this is quite contrary to how uh, TensorFlow was actually working before. So earlier on, you had to write every single thing, and you had to ensure that everything was proper. The all the all the you know model directories actually lined up. All this uh, in, even files were actually thrown out, things like that. So all these were actually you had to do it physically, and you had to ensure that uh, none of these was actually lost. Uh, in this case, uh, so estimator sort of uh, takes care of all this for you, and it, you don't have to worry about. How uh, so? In the, I, if if possible, what I could also do is uh, actually put it onto a TensorFlow serving. I can simply see if you can see the model here. Uh, if you actually uh, do an export function, if you do the export function over here, you'll basically see another folder which is going to have uh, the export uh, some random number which is going to have the saved variables and the variable folder also in it, which is basically ready for TensorFlow serving. So you don't have to write much. Uh, all you can do is you can simply use the estimator and then take care of, uh, it takes care of scaling, it takes care of serving, and it, all you, you need to write the pipeline though. You need to write the model function and you need to actually get the uh, model out. So it's, it's pretty straightforward in that sense. So uh, let's get back to our, uh, the presentation that we have. Uh, so some of the key takeaways, I would say, um, 
that uh, probably is is the first thing and the most important thing uh, is to understand the problem and visualize the problem uh, and the most important thing is also to get your stats right uh, if you do not get your stats right uh, stats right then you are going to actually uh, work on skewed data which is not going to give you good results however good your classifier or your uh, your machine learning model is so that's very very important uh, another point is about uh, the test data so one thing that I see or uh, I have encountered is that uh, people don't care about test data. So basically, the test data is treated like uh, validation data. Uh, invariably, you use the test data, and then you see, oh, OK, so I train a model. It does not do well on the test data. I go back, and then I train the model again, and then I do a better job on the test data. So this should not be done. Uh, because what you're trying to do is you're looking at the test data and then you're inherently uh, through your knowledge of the test data and the error on the test data you're actually uh, you are uh, doing the you're actually porting the uh, error back into the model so you're effectively biasing the model and you are actually uh, training the model again uh, in this sense you are sort of cheating so uh, you're not cheating on an exam here but what will happen is uh, I've seen a lot of instances where uh, people train this and then put it into production what will happen is it will not uh, scale well the reason being that the test data was already looked at and that uh, people actually uh, you know you go back and then you train again based on what you inferred from the test data this is a big problem that I've seen and uh, this is the reason why if you if you look at the test data then throw your model so that's the the best practice so if you that's the reason why you split the train and the validation within the train data itself so split it in between the train and validation never look at the test data this is something uh, that you learn the hard way probably but but if you want to take the best practice, this is definitely a best practice. If you look at a test data, throw the training away and then start from scratch. So if you're going to start from scratch, probably because you still have the bias, you might have to start with new test data. But that's OK, because you're still not porting that bias back into the same model. Hopefully, it should be OK. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's the most important point, is to treat the test data with utmost respect. Um, and another thing is uh, very, very important is uh, experiment fast, fail fast. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, we are having GPUs and uh, why it's very, very important to understand the latency behind GPUs. And uh, it's not important, you know, it's fancy to say I run a P100, uh, I run an M40, uh, even without knowing what it's actually doing behind the scenes. Uh, if you do not understand the latency between how your data is actually ported into the GPU and how you're taking the data back out into your CPU and do the compute, uh, you're missing out something, but it's perfectly fine. But uh, it's important to fail fast. So you, you might try a hundred different experiments. Uh, it, not all of these will be good. Uh, invariably, you have to do this very, very quickly because uh, you don't have the infinite time to create a model. You need to do it as quickly as possible. And if you see uh, one of the reasons, uh, a recent uh, failure uh, from um, Baidu uh, was that they actually did this. So uh, they actually cheated in that sense that they actually have a lot of compute. Uh, they actually created multiple accounts to actually uh, do, do a lot more experiments. Uh, this is, although you, so in this, in this sense you have more compute which means that it does not give you the, uh, the, you know, the, the power to cheat, but effectively you need to actually experiment fast and you need to fail fast. So you need to actually say that, okay, the model does not work, throw it away or use the, uh, the experience that you gain from that model to actually build something new. So that's some, uh, a good takeaway that you should actually have. Uh, yeah, so one thing that I learned very hard way is uh, logging the experiment results. So not just the results, uh, logging the parameters also is very, very important because we are talking about deep neural networks and you have a lot of hyperparameters that you need to tune and you need to actually save and you need to save. So what happens is you will, at, at times you will actually very, very quickly you will change a lot of things like say uh, the embedding size or probably the batch size or uh, the learning rate and in the end what will happen is you would have done four or five things. Uh, you would get a better model, but you will never be able to replicate it again given a new data. So th this is the reason why you should actually log every single experiment and you should actually follow it up and understand the experiment. So uh, this will also give you a very good rigor in terms of making an experiment proper. So tomorrow if you get new data and if you want to say uh, this is the time that it's going to take to actually uh, you know, probably develop some model that actually comes up to par with the earlier model, uh, your experimental results are going to help you out in actually giving you that knowledge. So if you are, have, if you are going to be answerable to someone, uh, 
in saying how long it's going to take to build a model, your experimental results and uh, the results that you actually gain, the experience that you gain when you actually did your first set of experiments is going to give you uh, immense value. So that's the reason why it's very, very important to log your experimental results and your parameters. So don't forget the parameters. So results are always good, uh, but if you do not know what is actually going to give you that uh, result, it makes no sense to actually have the good great results. So tomorrow, uh, you need to make it uh, repeatable. So that's the reason why you need to log it. The point is also about scalability. Uh, so because most of the data that we have now are on enterprises or on a startup, so, uh, so I might have a startup which is actually uh, trying to, you know, say, extract features from images, for instance. So then uh, for, from day one, uh, I cannot say that I, I will basically build a model and then think about scalability when a million users come in. Uh, if you don't think about scalability from the start, then what will happen is you, in the, when you want to think of scalability, it will be very, very difficult for you to actually use a model that you actually built from scratch. So this is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, and this is actually, again, uh, learn from experience. So this is, again, one of the best practices that you should do if you're thinking about making putting a model into production. So scalability should go always hand in hand with all your experiments and all your model development. So it, it is fancy to get a deep neural network that does state of the art. It makes no sense if it is not going to perform uh, in the end. So it's, if it's going to take, say, two hours to just do one inference, it makes no sense to put it into production rather than get a very quick model which does, say, probably 5% less than the state of the art is still OK. For if you're not writing a paper, it makes no sense to have uh, that 5% or 10% improvement uh, when you're actually talking about production level use cases. So, and test for new domains. So, one of the, again, important things that uh, you should do is test on new domains, uh, which means that uh, I could probably train for something on, uh, say, for, for instance, I could train a classifier, uh, but uh, I need to actually understand how it actually performs on other domains. Uh, so this is going to give you uh, insights into how the classifier is going to work if it is not. Uh, so there are two ways you can evaluate it. One, you can train and then test it directly on something, even without training the data on that domain. Uh, the second thing is train on the domain and with the exact same parameters that you did on the first domain. So for instance, if you're having a, an example with, say, uh, healthcare ex uh, uh, test data or train data, and if you have an example with a banking data, and you have to see, you're going to effectively use the same training, data, training uh, classifier, uh, but uh, what you will try to do is you'll do no change in the classifier parameters and the training parameters. Effectively, you'll just change the data pipeline. You'll simply plug this out and plug this in, uh, the data pipeline here. And you, have, uh, you can actually see how your classifier is going to perform across different domains. So why this is important is because we're talking about scalability again. So when we are saying that we want to expand, so now that we want to target more customers, we want to target, uh, say, more domains, more verticals, this is going to be important because uh, in the end, if you cannot actually scale up uh, in terms of even, uh, say, new domains, then it makes no sense because you have to keep training or looking into a model every single time you're actually looking into a new domain. So this is the reason why you need to look at and uh, test on new domains. So this, this becomes very, very important uh, in the end. So this is sort of uh, uh, some of the best practices that I actually gained uh, from uh, some of the words that I've been working on for all along. So yeah, so that I think uh, concludes my presentation. Yeah, any questions? Yes. Your skill is referring to data or referring to the yes. So, classifier? Yes. So, uh, Thank you for asking the question. Uh, so uh, for, uh, in this case, so um, you, your classifier should first of all be, uh, anyway, it's actually batched. So your data is batched. So uh, your, your scalability in, in this sense is going to be in terms of inference, right? So uh, I'm going to say now I have trained a model. Uh, effectively, what I'm trying to do is now uh, for inference, uh, I would like to see if, uh, if this model can be used in production. Uh, effect, I want to actually see if uh, how many, uh, say, inferences I can do per second. If, if I'm thinking about, say, every inference is going to take one second, then I, I cannot deploy it on, say, behind a cloud, uh, or get an inference where people are going to click, keep clicking some mouse buttons just to get an inference for, say, probably uh, looking at the content of an image. 
So probably if I'm developing an image classifier, for example, uh, and if my inference on the image classifier uh, from that model that I've trained is going to take two seconds or three seconds, it makes no sense if, I, if there are 10,000 people uh, coming to my website to actually do some sort of an inference, then it makes no sense to actually put it into production, right? So there you see the scalability in terms of the number of people who are trying to infer something from your model. So that's something that you actually look at. Uh, the, yeah, so in this case, your data itself is coming in through uh, different uh, parameters. So the user is one way, and the users are basically feeding in the data. So uh, data plus the pipeline that you have trained, the model that you've trained, is going to talk about the overall scalability of your model. Thank you. Yep, and you get one here. So this is for you. Uh, oh, sure, thanks. Oh, yeah, sure. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sure. The question, um, I think in your code, uh, some play uh, that's about the accuracy baseline. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how much have you experimented the impact of the change of the accuracy based on it? Uh, to uh, in terms of time and also uh, accuracy. Okay, so uh, the question is about uh, the, the so if I've understood correctly, uh, so when evaluating your baseline, so how do you evaluate it in terms of determine and what is the impact? Yeah. So uh, when you did, uh, when you're actually evaluating your baseline, you don't uh, actually care about the inference time <coughs> because in this case you're trying to uh, you're trying to establish. Uh, the base score that you can you have to rather ma match up. So it is like uh, the reason is because these are all uh, classic methods of uh, getting, uh, say, a classifier, right? So an SVM, for instance, or uh, so uh, could actually do a linear classifier. That's one of the things why I started. So a linear classifier. These are all uh, straightforward. Uh, these are all uh, classifiers that have been there for a long, long time. And these are all things that actually show to work and is always been working. So in this case, uh, your baseline should always be the simplest model. Uh, and it, uh, so the reason you, you actually don't care is because you, you're not going to actually use it in the end. So rather, why, do you, why, why does it matter? Yes. So the, the question is, why does it matter? Is because you don't have a, a performance evaluation about how well you're doing. So say, suppose I am actually developing a deep neural network, right? So if I, if I, if my deep neural network cannot even do, say, 15% better than my, a linear classifier, for instance, then it makes no sense to actually develop a deep neural network, right? So that's the reason why you actually do a baseline evaluation. You, your, your idea is to beat the performance. Uh, of course, you can probably in the end your deep neural network might not even be as good as a neural. But if that is the case, then you go back and then you optimize the linear classifier or a baseline. Uh, until then, you just use it to have it as a baseline score for. Uh, basically, it's like telling myself that okay, okay, my I'm doing a great, better job. At least ten percent is much better to start with, and then I start up improving that. So, did I answer your question? <laughs> yes. So you have a question, yes, uh, just a question. Yes, actually I have two questions. Yeah. First is regarding the uh, training the uh, test data with respect. Because uh, if I want to deploy a model into production, I have to, I have to test my model with the test data, right? If that, it doesn't turn out good, I need to go back to the model. So, no, that's why, oh, okay, yeah. So that's a good question. So this is, the, this is a mistake. So you, you never test with the test data. So you, you always split your train data into a, a train and a dev or a validation. So this is why you need to know that your test data is always. So the thing that you have to evaluate is finally, in the end of the day, when you're going to say put up a performance on, uh, say, your website. So that, that is the only time when you'd actually do a test. You never do an evaluation on your test until you are going to say uh, put a, put up some performance measure to a customer or something else. Because uh, uh, you, yeah, your question is valid, which means that you want to say even before I put it in production, how do I evaluate my model? That is why you actually split your train into train and validation. So the test data is only for like, reporting. Yeah, the test data is to uh, yeah, ensure that your your model generalizes well. It's not for report reporting. Was just an example I gave you. It is to ensure that. 
uh, your, your assumptions about you making changes onto your training data and your model itself from the validation data actually reflects back into generalization across different test data. What if the, the uh, result of the test data is you have to accept it. That's the mistake. That so this basically uh, that, that's when your exploration about uh, your uh, so that, that's when your exploration data exploration shows uh, you you probably did incorrect assumptions about the data in which how it was actually probably distributed. So this is one good time when you actually look back into so the root cause. Basically, seeing uh, you have to understand the features, you have to understand the data, uh, how the data is distributed, uh, what is it that actually contributes. So one more important thing could also also be the error analysis. Uh, so when you do a test data evaluation, you need to see how where the actual data failed. So it's great to report 93% accuracy, but if you understand the 7% cases where it fails, you can actually see probably you can develop ensemble methods, so things like uh, other classifiers that does well on the 7%, and you could probably think of combining these two classifiers to make a better classifier. So the error analysis gives you a, a way or uh, an, uh, in, uh, you know, something out of an insight into how you can develop a model better for the future. But you have to, there's no other goal, but you don't go back and then change your training model again. Then I still de deploy my model to, de uh, to production even if test data uh, yes, unfortunately, you have to do it. Uh, if you time if time is limited, then you say this is what is happening, and then you go back to your drawing board, uh, restart uh, from what you actually saw because of the lessons that you learned earlier. You're going to start from scratch, hopefully not biasing the the training uh, the model with the test data that we've already seen. So you don't do your performance analysis on the test data until and unless you actually have uh, understood what is actually taking on the train data. So yeah, so th the train test data, that's why it's very, very important. Otherwise, your model is never going to generalize. You're always going to bias your model with the uh, information that you have from the test data. My second question is, uh, on testing a, the model on new domains, when you come to new domains, the data will be different, the features True. will be different. How do you fit your, the new data into your existing model? True, that's what I'm saying. So th that's where, uh, so, so the assumption here is that uh, when I mean by uh, changing the domains, uh, it's just that you're actually moving in from, so you, your data pipelines are more or less fixed. I'm assuming that your classifier is fixed. Uh, the, only the source from which the data is actually obtained is actually changing. So my assumptions are that uh, I have uh, certain things that are constant, which is basically, for me, it's the data types. The data input is basically the same. Uh, the classifier is the same. Uh, all my data is the data source. The people who are generating the data is going to change for me. Space, right? but the meaning could be totally different. True. The so yeah. So that's so, doesn't make sense. So that's yeah. So in your case, that's a particular uh, different uh, domain altogether, and the problem is totally different. Uh, the cases that I'm actually referring to is say, for example, if you train a classifier, text classification, then you would basically say use it for different data sets. The same classifier, without changing any parameters in the classifier, you will try to basically say use a TF-IDF plus uh, so things like you will actually use a linear SVM and you will never change this pipeline. All you will do is basically change the uh, input data and the target variables, and you will simply tr keep training again and again to see the effect of how good the classifier can actually perform, uh, and how much of a t uh, tuning that perform the classifier is to a particular data. That will actually give you whether it can actually generalize across different data. Yeah. So the long discussion was about taking care of what you're doing, yes. and also remembering what you did. True. So in this case, like, what's your best practice <coughs> to log whatever you're doing? Yeah. So do you, do you know this will make your life yes. easier. So um, one thing that we do is we have an internal tool that actually logs every parameter change that we have uh, in an experiment. Uh, we actually wrote it ourselves, basically a Python, uh, basically a Python class that's actually logging in all the uh, parameters that you want it to be logged. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a very complicated tool you don't have to worry about. But the best way that I do, rather, uh, I was actually doing uh, was have an Excel file. So the minute you actually have, say, for example, I showed a deep neural network, so three layers, 256, 64, one, uh, one, 256, 128, 64, uh, you have put on an Excel sheet and then simply keep changing the different parameters and then see the final impact on the performance. So all you're trying to do is your input is a constant. Uh, you're changing the hyperparameters, which are basically the number of layers, sorry, the number of uh, parameters in the every layer, and then uh, no nothing else changes. So you cannot keep changing everything, so you need to keep something constant and then change something else. What do you log at the end, like, in the, in the sense of numeric numbers, how 
Was the error? Was there yes, the error, yes. The important point is the error. So the training loss and the validation loss is what is going to give you the final uh, evaluation of both the model. So however good it may do, uh, say 95% or 96% is not going to say whether your model has actually learned all of it that it has to learn. So for instance, if your training loss is actually very high, it actually shows that your model has not has much more to learn, which means that you can actually fit more into the model or probably have a deeper network and it can actually extract more information. Uh, although this might probably give you 85%, you never discuss about the 85% probably only when you talk to a customer or someone who where this number is going to make sense to them. But to you as a data scientist, it makes sense to actually log only the, uh, the loss values. Because this is going to tell uh, how, and, and this is the reason why you need to keep things constant. If you're going to change the optimizer, for instance, your logs, uh, your values are going to change. If you have an RM optimizer as an RMS prop, uh, things are going to change here and there. So you have to keep things, certain things constant, and you need to log all those constant things, and you need to keep changing only a few parameters, and you need to log everything in one particular sheet. And uh, what you do is, you, you for all those changes that you made, if you make a change in a different parameter, for instance, uh, if you're changing an RMS prop or to, to an RM optimizer, then you change it to a different sheet. And you can do effectively the same experiment again and again. Uh, with Excel's, what happens is you can actually plot it neatly onto another sheet, and you can actually see the results again beautifully. So that's the reason why I'm saying Excel is actually very good. So of course, if you want, if you don't want to uh, use Excel, you can of course go to Google Cloud and then so it on a spreadsheet on the cloud. So of course that is possible. But yeah, this is one way you can actually log the experiments. So something just came in my mind. Like, Let's say, because as a, as a programmer, like we do simulation mm -hmm. uh, as a brute force, let's mm -hmm. say. So we do, maybe we do a lot of for loops inside, and then we, let's say there's so many parameters. Yeah. There are a few models. Yeah. Is it possible in this TensorFlow environment also that one night I just hit the button, mm -hmm. keep all the things in the in the range, in the group, and they pick up a few combinations yes. together? Yes. And at the end, it log everything. Yes. Again. So there is an experiments function. Uh, with TensorFlow, uh, what happens is the experiments, uh, you sort of give it a different set of lists. lists and your model is going to remain a constant. And what TensorFlow will do is basically go through the entire experiment and then it can actually produce, uh, so the tensor board, it'll actually produce a result on tensor board by saying which model is doing the best and it'll actually log everything. So yes, it is possible. That is also a one way to do it. So if you're completely on TensorFlow, uh, but the, the question is this is not going to be like a quick change. So in general, uh, why this is okay is because if you have a lot of compute and if you have a lot of time, you can do the experiment sort of a method. But in general, if you're training a deep neural network, say for instance, if you're training an image classifier, uh, you will not have the time to actually say train uh, for 100 epochs. Uh, you cannot let the uh, experiment, let's say if I'm running 25 experiments, I cannot run it for 25 times for over say 200 days. Instead, what you effectively do is you train for five epochs and you train all the experiments for five epochs and you see the impact at the end of five epochs or 10 epochs, for instance. And uh, you choose the model that actually does best across those 10 epochs and then you use that, those, that model to train till the end. So probably for 200 epochs or 100 epochs. Effectively, you come down from a large uh, a set of experiments to probably a few. You could probably not come down to one. Uh, because you're still not certain. So effectively, you can still come to, say, five or three, and you can still run those three on probably a grid or some cluster that you have that probably has a lot of compute. How, how far we are for PyTorch? <laughs> so that's a good question. So uh, what TensorFlow is doing is uh, it's actually one of the things that a reason why uh, uh, TensorFlow is evolving, uh, especially with the 1.5 update, if you look at it, uh, what TensorFlow is doing is basically uh, going somewhat uh, similar to the uh, PyTorch method. So that's where uh, you can actually do an evaluate of the method right in, in, in place. Uh, all, all along, you, if you actually create a, a variable, you will have to run it in a session to actually look at the value itself. Uh, what PyTorch uh, did very, very effectively was uh, give you some sort of a Python-esque sort of an approach, where you, in place, you do all the compute and you do the, compu the computational graph is taken care of behind the scenes. Uh, with 1.5 and above, uh, there, is an there is a new uh, mode called eager mode, which is going to do exactly what PyTorch is doing, or probably do that better. So there is also something called a tape, uh, where all the computes are basically um, logged, and then you also have something. So it's going to be a very interesting sort of a, a few weeks that to follow up because the RC0 is released for 1.5, and one, uh, for even uh, for the past few months, the eager mode was available on the source anyway. But uh, the eager mode is something that uh, what PyTorch was actually doing, and TensorFlow is sort of catching up to it. And uh, PyTorch does not do certain things well. 
so TensorFlow was not doing certain things well, and now TensorFlow is sort of catching up to those things where it was not doing well. It's definitely good to follow TensorFlow. See, the, the, the target is not about TensorFlow or PyTorch. Uh, the end, uh, the idea is to learn about what deep neural networks are and to apply your what you've learned theoretically into practice. So if you find PyTorch to be useful, go ahead. Uh, so just because uh, you know I, I have some affiliation uh, to the you know to TensorFlow, and I, I, I cannot say that this is the only thing that you have to follow. If you uh, of course it, it depends on how comfortable you are with using a tool. Uh, TensorFlow is definitely good at most of the things. Certain things it is definitely not good, but it will definitely improve. But to start with, uh, effectively TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch almost have very similar counterparts. Uh, if you see, but uh, yes, so it's up to you. It's completely up to your comfort. But TensorFlow is definitely, uh, I will recommend TensorFlow because of its pure fact that you can move from uh, pr uh, development to production without much of a hassle. Yeah, I, I've used it personally, and we use that in SAP as well. Um, I noticed, um, I, like in, in my experience um, with SKLearn, I really like the custom evaluation metrics. Mm -hmm. Like you can write your own. Yes. Is, does the same thing happen in like the new like revamp TensorFlow? Yes. So uh, it was available anyway even before. Okay. So uh, even in the earlier versions of TensorFlow, mm -hmm. you could always write your own loss functions and you could do this. Yeah. Yes, with the new ones, you can also do that. So you can write your own, probably if you don't find a triplet loss, for instance, then you can write your own triplet loss and then you could still use it for your training. Yes, okay. it's definitely possible. And just out of curiosity, um, I noticed with like um, unbalanced data sets, mm -hmm. um, they're really, sometimes they're really hard to evaluate. Mm -hmm. And just out of curiosity, why did you use accuracy to evaluate the model that you showed us? Yeah, so uh, in this case, uh, I should have used precision and recall to actually see the effect across different classes, that's true. Uh, this is just a quick example to show uh, a juxtaposition between scikit-learn and uh, TensorFlow and how you can actually interchangeably use the pipelines and things like that. But uh, in a real use case, probably you should do better sampling. So probably use something like SMORT where you can actually oversample for classes where, or undersample for the classes where the bias is high. So these are all ways you can actually uh, avoid this bias. Uh, this, the best way or the easiest way is to, of course, uh, choose the class which has the, low, the number of uh, uh, records for the class which has the lowest and then use that for training. That is also one way to do it. But yeah, so just uh, yeah, this is because then I have to explain about what I'm doing here about uh, undersampling and oversampling and okay. things like that. So th I just wanted to keep things simple because yeah, as, a, as a, uh, someone who actually starts uh, TensorFlow, someone who's looking at uh, TensorFlow, I don't want things to be complicated. So this is, we keep simple, of course, when people encounter such problems, uh, they will definitely uh, go and understand uh, about bias and things like that. Okay. Th thanks so much. Thank you. Hey. Hey. You were mentioning about the, like, I was training with model chaos, yes. and, and I saved it. Yes. Um, can I put it into the TensorFlow? Yes. Or? So, uh, so one thing to understand is Keras is not uh, Keras is basically just a high-level API specification. Keras is not running anything underneath. It, it either uses uh, Tiano or TensorFlow or CNTK in the newest version, or uh, a lot more underlying frameworks to actually do the training. So it, it's a very nice API, high-level API. Uh, so effectively, if you're using a TensorFlow backend, all your variables will be stored in the TensorFlow format. So effectively, when you store your model, even if you use Keras to train it, you're still going to get a TensorFlow model in the end. If you're going to store a HDHF file, right? So your HDFI file uh, would still be compatible with TensorFlow. Because HDFI file was, because in the, the TensorFlow, right, the, 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 and the model is saved in the, in the meta and the index. And true. So true. I, 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 I had a model which mm -hmm. was in Keras mm -hmm. in HDFI uh, format. Okay. I want to use it. Uh, okay. I so, had some problem. Actually, yeah. You mentioned that uh, you have something. True. So that's when. So if you if you have to specifically move from Keras to TensorFlow, uh, or where you have that sort of a limitation, you basically uh, restore the variables into Keras, and then you save the variables uh, for a, each layer individually, and then you restore it to TensorFlow. So that way, because your model is effectively the same, your network structure is the same across the Keras and TensorFlow, uh, you can save the model and the weights uh, separately as a NumPy variable probably, and then restore it into the new TensorFlow graph. So that way, you're effectively maintaining consistency between the weights, and you don't have to worry about the file format in the end. In the end, it's only as the way in which you retrieve it and then how you're going to uh, see the data. But it's not really straightforward. Not, not that straightforward. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 Thank you. One quick question. Yes. 
Uh, first, thank you for uh, sure. doing the sharing session. Sure. Um, so you mentioned about uh, interchangeability between scikit-learn and TensorFlow. Yes. So one of the things I like to use scikit-learn for um, is to actually do some processing of features mm -hmm. in all of my model. Yeah. And I found that the scikit-learn pipeline class was actually pretty useful in like defining the whole pipeline mm -hmm. of how to my transforms and feed it to the model. Yeah. So is I mean, to your knowledge, is TensorFlow uh, estimators suitable for something like that? Yes. Does it play well with TensorFlow serving? Absolutely, yes. So t see, uh, you have to understand that scikit-learn, the, the data processing pipelines are still uh, completely independent of the TensorFlow estimator. Estimator is uh, just a classifier in this case. It's trying to define a deep neural network or probably a linear classifier. And all it's trying to do is basically, uh, d d you know, uh, the, the separation between the data pipeline and the classifier or the, the m m machine learning model pipeline is completely different. So uh, uh, you don't have to uh, worry about uh, using the, the, the scikit pipeline with the TensorFlow. Like I showed you, you can interchangeably use the pipeline along with, so if you're doing pre-processing with scikit, absolutely no issues using it with TensorFlow. Because in the end, these are all NumPy variables or just in the end a tensor, tensor uh, which is just a matrix and uh, it's just a representation in the end. So uh, Python takes care of uh, how it's actually done. Thanks. Um, just, just to follow up. Um I'm not too familiar with TensorFlow serving, mm -hmm. um, but could you like package both your processing pipelines and scikit-learn as well as ah. the five and, yeah. and put that in? Yeah. So, so what TensorFlow serving does is basically uh, give you a way to actually put a model into production. So effectively, I could basically, if I have a server that's actually looking at the inputs, uh, it's basically like an API web service. Uh, I could define the input pipeline, and uh, I just define what is the output going to be. Uh, effectively, uh, it's not going to look at how the data is pre-processed and how the data is going to be uh, post-processed after it's been. So uh, the, the TensorFlow serving model itself is just going to take in the data, whatever you give it, and whatever it is trained, it's going to produce an output basically from whatever it's trained. So if you don't give it data that it has actually trained on uh, based on the pre-processing that you actually used for the training, it is not going to do well if you don't pre-process data. So you have to do the pre-processing separately. Or can do it within no, oh. no. This is purely for the uh, the graph definition, for the inference, and for the uh, the output. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. All right. Okay. Then uh, thank you and uh, have a good night. <laughs>